Excellent. Okay, guys, this is going to be a whirlwind. Is everybody ready? This year at CodeMash, a local development conference, not information security, it's very different, uh, there was a CTF. And actually, it's been for the last four years. Shows how well I'm paying attention. And for the last three years, I've been telling myself, you know, I know the guy who started this. I, I should really do the CTF. And then this year came up, and I was very busy. And I told myself, you know, it opens at the end of December. I, I should really do the CTF. And I didn't. And then I got to the conference. And I didn't make it into the first session. And I sat down next to someone else who is there that is also here. I'll let him decide if he wants to identify himself. And we started talking a little bit about the CTF. And I went, you know what? I got three hours to burn. I'm going to start on the CTF. And I was hooked. And I did as much of it as I possibly could. And I'm going to just real quick do a run through of what it looked like and uh, kind of what my journey was as fast as possible. I'm going to rely on you guys. If there's something that I'm going too fast on and you want more details, please holler, get my attention. If you throw something, make sure it's not too hard. And I'll go into a little bit more depth. Also, afterwards, of course, I'll be around so we can talk about it. Um, but I really am just going to book it through here so that we can get done soon. Real fast, the spoiler alert on this, uh, the, the CTF is still open for a couple more weeks. So if you want to go and do it yourself without, I don't know if you're going to actually give out the answer. All the answers. <laughs> so, so yeah, you spoilers. Do it yourself without knowing what's going, you know, the answers to the challenges here. Absolutely. However, on the flip side, if you don't want to do it yourself, but you felt like I went too fast, didn't include something, or you just forget about it later, there's now at least three really good write-ups that you can search for relating to the 2019 CodeMash CTF, and I highly recommend them. I would say something like, I'm going to do one. But really, at this point, I'm just too embarrassed because they're pretty awesome. So you can go ahead and look at those. But this is just my personal journey. And so first step on the journey is I was met with this beautiful CTF page with a list of challenges. Now, when I first started doing this at CodeMash, there were several open already that, that had already been opened from the 27th of December on. Um, but there were also some that were still closed. And me being the first time that I was ever doing one of these, really, uh, like I said, for four years I kept saying I should, I just kind of started off easy. Because, you know, ASCII art, like, how hard can ASCII art be? Oh, and now it's not going to work, but that's right. I've got to back up if it really doesn't want to work. So when I open up the ASCII art challenge, what I was met with, it'll look prettier later. Uh, here, what I was met with, the raw information that I was met with, is this, code mash. Now, I don't know how well you can see from back there, but interspersed in here, there's some numbers. Again, spoilers, spoilers all, spoilers. Anybody have any guesses? What are those numbers? ASCII codes. <gasps> They're ASCII codes! I don't think that was actually a guess. I feel like you have done this one before or something. <laughs> Constantly, right? So uh, me being me, of course, I extracted those out and got a list of them and wrote a little Python script. If you don't know me, I'm a big Python advocate. There's only one Python. It's Python 3. Um, but this little script went ahead and read that list file, looped over the lines, turned each line that was a uh, string into an integer, and then turned that into the character. All that said and done, spoiler, this is what we got out of it. This is what the flags looked like. And this is where I'm going to take a brief moment to mention that uh, while I haven't had broad experience with Capture the Flags, I have at least had some exposure to them before. And the flags in this one, I was particularly pleased with. Because all of them were this gooey looking, or gooey looking thing. I don't know if anybody knows what gooids look like. This is kind of gooey looking, you know, some dashes, four characters, that kind of stuff. And they all started with CM19. 
And that was a wonderful help later on, especially for somebody that was new to them, because I could kind of self-identify, yes, that looks like a flag, instead of some of the more hardcore capture the flags, where you'd just be slinging anything and everything at the submit box to try and make sure. So props to uh, Hacking Lab, who, who hosted this, for doing the flags like that. So that one was pretty easy, right? Ask Yard, gotta love Ask Yard. Let's see if this is working now. No, of course it's not. Why would it work? That would be too easy. Okay, let's, I really do wanna show you guys some of the fancy, so let's see if I can get this working real quick. There we go, okay. So that was Ask Eric. They all came up with a nice little pop-up like this. Here's what I showed you. Oh, I forgot the description too. I love ASCII art. What about you? And of course, ASCII, uppercase. Um, littered all throughout this in various forms were those kind of hints, and there were also dedicated hints. You'll see a view hint button down here, and so you could click that and get a hint. Uh, I did not do the hints on all of them, uh, so I don't know what some of them are. But uh, continuing forward, we're going to skip a couple here. Uh, we'll real quick touch on this. Capture the phallog. The phallog is easy to catch, isn't it? Well, long story short here is you'll notice, especially because I mentioned it twice out loud, phallog is flag in the wrong order. And so we take the raw, we do, oh, here it is, unscramble. We do the ordering, right? And like I mentioned, really liked those flags. They give me a real good idea of what to look for. Keep on scrambling, keep on scrambling until we get to the end. And then that whole thing, each of these lines, gives us our final flag. So that one's pretty straightforward as well, right? Well, these are the easy ones. So let's get a little bit tougher, right? This was actually one of my favorite ones, busted file. And at this point, I was still pretty high on life. I was having a blast. It was a good time, and so this was the perfect time for me to solve this one. Uh, busted file, alphabetization is weird. Okay, busted file. I'm going to have to kind of set down the mic and just shout at this point because I do need both my hands for typing even though I grew up in the 90s. So if we open up a hex editor, some people got that joke. If we open up a hex editor, then I can open up the file that they gave us, bouncing back here, busted file. We can download busted.zip. If I open up the busted.zip, the first thing that caught my eye in particular is the fact that this is a very odd sequence of characters for the beginning of a zip file. In fact, actually, if I know anything about zip files, that sequence should look like this. And in this case, I did. Now, you might not, and that's fine. Uh, wonderfully, we have this thing called Google. You can very quickly discern that. But it did require a little bit of, of pre-knowledge, right? You have to understand that files have these magic bytes at the beginning that identify the format. Um, and so if you didn't have that, you wouldn't get that. But for me, that was a blast. And I continued on my merry way. Well, if we go and extract the fixed zip, what we end up with is an image and it says the flag is in this file. Now, because I like audience participation, except for Tyler's not allowed to answer this one because I'm pretty sure he's the one who taught me it, where should I look next? I've got a JPEG. I think you're out of the running too, Mike. Huh? Exif. Exif. Okay, so once again, a little bit more knowledge. If you weren't aware of it, you might have to go digging and try and figure this out, but JPEGs have EXIF information, which are, is an additional stream of information that's tucked inside of it. Um, some of the uses of it include things like the focus setting, if you actually took the picture with the digital camera. But you can put tons of information in there. In fact, you, you can put uh, the, well, the X and Y resolution, uh, the software that was used for, hey, that's funny, what does this look like? 
a flag. Come on, guys, have fun. So once again, <laughs> dump the EXIF data. Um, in this case, I will mention I used uh, a tool. I think it was, actually, I should have it here. I used uh, EXIF tool on my Mac in order to dump that information really easily. Uh, but then I had the flag. I could submit it and continue forward. You just paste it in the box here, hit submit, little check box comes, or little check comes up, and I get the points. So that one was probably the highlight of this whole thing. That one's the one that I loved the most because it had a couple of steps, but it wasn't a really heavy lift. It just required a little bit of pre-knowledge, a little bit of understanding of file formats and you know what that involves. Um, there's a bunch of different ways that you could have cut it. Um, you, if you really wanted to get fancy, you could have even uh, wrote a quick and easy Python script that ignores those first couple of bytes and opens that stream as a uh, zip archive, even though that wasn't the correct starting bytes for it. Uh, if you want to get less fancy with the EXIF data, strings will work just fine as well. You don't have to use a specialized EXIF tool in this case. Strings would dump it out just as easily. But then we start hitting on some of the more involved ones. Um, I'm going to skip Mrs. Robot for the moment. I'm going to go to Espresso. Espresso gave us Espresso.class. And yes, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. That's all right. Espresso.class is a Java file, as that pretty little picture tells us. And if we open it up, I can't spell or say it. Uh, that class will notice that it's a binary file. Okay, well, Java decompilation is a thing, so we're going to go ahead and run some Java decompilation. And we find this fun little Java chunk of code. And we have to take a couple more steps, right? Now we've got a key and a cipher and some code that we kind of have to sort out. But I mean, because we decompiled it to this, we can just modify the code and recompile it, right? So maybe instead of all that dancing around and the true false check and whatnot, we just have it run the key and the cipher through its little mechanism and print out the string buffer directly. There's just a little bit of tinkering and whatnot. I'm. Uh, I'm not in any way good at Java, so don't think that I really knew what I was doing. I basically just brute forced it till I got something that looked kind of right and worked. That's what you do in Java anyways, right? <laughs> hey, so long story short, it spit out that flag. Um, also, uh, the, the JAD Java decompiler is the one that I used, and there was an online, I don't have it listed here at the moment, there was an online um, kind of REPL almost for Java that I was able to dump it in and run it directly. And so I didn't have to, you know, pollute my MacBook with Java and whatnot. Um, so at some point said the actual code read cipher and key. That was, so if, if that came from decompiling, does that mean that they compiled it like with debug and they left it there? It's Java. That <laughs> happens anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, you, you, can, you can obfuscate it intentionally, but normal compilation of both uh, anything .NET and Java, it includes all that information by default. Today you learned. Aren't you excited? Okay, so that one, that's how I solved that one. Uh, and submit the flag, got the points. We're on to some more fun. Uh, Dot nutcracker, as you might intuit by the name, was a similar sort of challenge, but with .NET instead of Java. So that one was fun too. Uh, danger Zone, I don't actually remember what Danger Zone was. What was Danger Zone? Uh, can you enter, oh, Danger Zone. Danger Zone was a fun one. Can you enter the Danger Zone and find the flag? There is a service listening on blah, 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 5553. This is not about the website Danger Zone. I really meant to go to that website later, but I'm still a little bit nervous. So we're just gonna skip that part. Okay, long story short, I floundered a whole bunch. I threw a whole bunch of tools at it. I was playing with Nmap, 
I was playing with manual port scans. I, what else was I doing? I was uh, lots of different options of MMAP, actually. I kept going through different iterations of it, trying to figure out what was up. Um, I, I ran dig against it because zone, as in possibly a DNS zone, at least that's what I thought. Um, and, and I just, I kept going at it. XFR, it, it, but I just, I couldn't find <coughs> the flag. You know, I, like I'm, I'm getting these and whatnot. Where is the flag? Well, it turns out, once you get through all that, you realize that, you know, dig, you have to be very specific about the order of arguments, and it has to be AXFR, not AFXR. Real, real quick slip that, yeah, yeah, you, you just have to make sure you type the command correctly, and you get it. And so I started with an nmap, finally got that right identified that there was a bind server running on 555.3 and then did a zone transfer request, I believe it's called. Somebody that's got better network chops can feel free to correct me, um, which basically dumped out the content that then I needed for the flag. And I don't know if I've got that floating around in here or not. Up here? There. Good eye. Better than me. So there you go. And I believe that's technically part of that one. No, no, that's its own. So yeah, that's the, the flag. Type it in. Bob's your uncle. Or danger will... What does it say? Rob? Oh, I just got that joke. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate that. <laughs> I was just typing flags in. Like, seriously, I was hooked by this thing. You have no idea. Um, I basically spent the rest of the conference attempting to solve it. Um, Crafty Cat was a really annoying one. You should definitely look that up if you're not looking to, to solve it. Um, Crafty Cat happened to be an RSA implementation. Um, and, yeah, I'll just I'll let that be an exercise for you. And it, it was really interesting. Uh, the answer ended up being a tool, really. I mean, you, if, if you really knew what you were doing, you could write the code yourself, but, but the answer ended up just being a tool. You know, sometimes the right answer to some of this kind of stuff is to use what others have ended up developing, what they've provided, not necessarily trying to go the high road of crafting all your own solutions and whatnot. And there's probably some deeper lesson about software development in there, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> Tool and good timing, okay. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, the parrot, okay, so I skipped over uh, unicorn here, and that's because the parrot is a similar one. Uh, these were particularly fun for me because they had nothing to do with the standard routes that I would have gone. Um, for instance, uh, parrot here, you'll notice, is a PDF that's password protected. This is the file that we got from it. Well, if you open up, you know, on any normal program in the Mac, it doesn't say anything. But if you open it up, apparently in some programs, I was later told, you get an information box that gives you some information. I, of course, had to go about the hard way, being ridiculous. Uh, where's the parrot? The parrot. So I ran strings against it. And strings had happened to drop this out. In retro, or not retrospect, in... in Looking the other way, hindsight. hindsight, thank you. Um, I probably could have just opened the file directly. In fact, uh, why don't we try that now? Yep, there we go. So I could just open the file directly. Uh, PDF is uh, PostScript. It's an interpreted Turing complete language. It is insane. You wonder why there's so many exploits. It's because you can write anything you want to in PostScript. Um, but I ran strings against it because I'm me. And then I sorted the strings and I did unique. And then, unfortunately, I don't have it sitting here, but then I did a length comparison and figured out uh, the top 10 longest strings or something like that. And long story short, I found two very interesting things. The first one says, this is not the flag. Good to know. The second one says, Charlie, Romeo, Alpha, Charlie, Kilo, Echo, Romeo, which spells out cracker. Here's where I once again decided to be complicated. Um, 
PDF Cracker. We need a PDF Cracker. There's even a program named PDF Cracker to crack the password. Anybody got any guesses about what the password could be? Cracker. I, I feel a little bit better now. I got a couple of other answers, so at least I wasn't you know, completely off the rails. Yes, the password is Cracker. And so in this case, since I had the tool sitting around already, I used QPDF to rip the password off of it, giving me a nice pristine PDF to work with. And then I ended up using a program that I absolutely adore. It's worth the money. It is a paid program if you have to do any vector work, and that is called Affinity Designer. But really, most vector editing programs um, like Inkscape will let you mess with this stuff in the exact same way. This one's just shiny and pretty and has an awesome logo and that makes me feel good. Um, long story short, oh, I need to blow that up some. There's the flag. So you have to hide that layer. And if you're working in other programs, you might just drag it off or something. This is easiest for me. Um, side note, you'll notice that they did kind of hide it another layer deeper in that this is not text. This is part of the image. And so then you have to do a special operation, which is called decoding with your eyes, and type the flag in. Then save. Bye-bye, Polly. Okay, two more to go. Um, actually, three more. I'll touch on ghost text real quick. Uh, ghost text, pretty much, and I'll go into that. So ghost text gave us a raw text file. <coughs> uh, what did I call it here? Ghost text, okay, so ghost text gave us a raw text file and uh, like a true uh, Linux Unix noob, I just threw it in less. And I noticed it looked kind of funny. And actually if I, if I you know, even open it up in VS Code here, Where's my ghost text? If I open it up here, it, it, it looks fine there, right? It looks, it looks fine there, but um, on command line through less, something interesting happens. I've got all these Unicode characters that are just hiding in there, you know, invisible, like ghosts. Haha, <laughs> the joke. Um, but from here, I got a little stumped because I ran a couple different attempts at some different types of encoding or whatnot. Um, I tried like a, uh, a, a pulse type thing, like with electronics, you know, so pulse high, pulse low, that kind of thing. I, I tried that, yeah, none of that worked. I, um, I tried bit shifting where I was like, okay, well maybe this is an offset or something and that's the start, you know, zero, and then whatever the value for capital I and the value for N are. Yeah, none of that worked. And so I finally ended up giving up and looking at the hint, and sure, I'll view it again. And uh, the hint gave me this, which was very interesting because it both gave me a direction to go in and confused the living daylights out of me. <laughs> You'll notice that it says AA underscore representing kind of like a space, right? Like, like if we look at this file, we, we've got some spaces here. Uh, but the problem is, is what do I do when that underscore is starting it? Because there are no examples of that. So after fighting with that for a while, I just ended up giving up and deciding I was going to ignore that leading one. And then you'll notice that following the hint, a, a, space, zero one zero zero one I, at least for my weird developer brain I went oh okay well this is a zero and then this is a zero so zero zero and then the space is an or operation on the previous bit which means it's a one so zero one zero zero one but that made it fairly trivial for me to then write some code that once again, is probably overblown. I've seen some examples of code that's much cleaner and neater. Um, first, we turn that sequence that represents the Unicode character into an underscore, because underscore. Then we turn everything else that's not an underscore into an A. Um, I had a lot of fun with this because the way that I read through this, I read it as bytes, which meant that I had to chunk it into three byte chunks 
and check because the Unicode characters were three bytes and the regular characters were one byte. And so I ran through after replacing that and did the operation I just described where when I had an A, I append a zero. When I have an underscore, I go back one item in the list and I or it, perform an or operation for that previous item. Uh, you'll also notice that this is where I just skipped it and said, hey, if you don't have a previous item in your list, you know, like that first character, i just skip over it. <laughs> and in the end it worked. Oh, and then I had to, uh, so this, this is pulled directly from the Python documentation, this grouper. I had to group them together uh, and end up doing basically a binary conversion into bytes that then gave me the ASCII characters and I got the flag out of it. Uh, so technically cars was the last one released. That one was a lot of fun. Um, did I mention that tool sometimes is the right answer? Because it's all about SQL injection. And while I can tell you plenty about uh, defending against SQL injection, I would not consider myself worthy of any red team even sideways glances because I can't manage to pull off a successful SQL injection against this manually. But good news, there's something called SQL map that you can just run against it and it figures it out and dumps all the information you need. So yay, SQL map, it's actually a really good tool. Um, I, I would highly recommend that you clone any production databases that you currently have, like clone the whole box on one that's non-production because this gets scary and just uh, you know run this thing against it a couple of times. Um, and then maybe go to your boss and run this thing against it in front of him a couple of times. And if you want motivation, uh, you can show him just how far script kitties will go because it's a little bit scary. And something that's vulnerable in any sort of vulnerable web application or just directly at the database layer, uh, this thing basically harvests everything automatically. Like I wasn't kidding when I said that I wasn't able to execute a manual SQL injection attack. I wasn't able to, I literally just ran this and got the flag, which was even a very poorly MD5 hashed password, but it automatically cracked it for me as well. And it's got rainbow tables and it can even crack with salt given enough time. And it just, this, this tool is amazing. So yeah, highly, highly suggest go play around if you get a chance or just find a, a sample one. That brings me to the last one. Um, I made my way through all of these fairly quickly. Even the last one, even the SQL injection one, I had to use a tool, but you know, I, I got through it fairly well, uh, except for stacked up. Stacked up, I had to have a significant amount of help. And most of that help just consisted of getting me out of my own head. And I think there's a broader lesson here. So going to information security conferences, coming to Neo ISF, I see some pretty amazing stuff from some pretty amazing people. And it, it kind of poisoned me a little bit because I thought somehow in my mind that I needed to live up to that. And so to execute this one, you know, obviously, uh, as I was working forward with it, um, I found out that it was a listening service. When I dumped a whole bunch of stuff at it, sometimes referred to as fuzzing, I noticed at a very specific point, it would just crash instead of echoing back what I had sent it. If you haven't caught on already, that's indicative of a buffer overflow of some kind. And then my brain went into overdrive where I thought, okay, now I've got to use everything that I've learned here. I've got to do a NOP sled. I have to figure out some ROP gadgets. I have to, yeah, it, it got really silly because in the end, all you really needed to do was find the proper address, which did rely on a little bit of uh, decompilation of the binary, but and I bet my daughter could do it, and she's only four. Um, no, honestly, like it, it wasn't, it really wasn't that big of a deal, guys, but you, you just found the address, and then you just sent the address in proper byte order, but sent the address as the tail end of that buffer overflow. That's it. No gadgets, no sleds. This is turning into a really weird talk, especially with that snow out there. Anyways, you, you, you just had to do that. And really the, the larger lesson here is sometimes 
it can be a lot of fun to just try something new and try and keep it as simple as possible. Don't build up this huge imagining. I didn't need all of this knowledge that I picked up and I wouldn't have been able to do it anyways, as clearly it took a lot of help at the end of the conference to get me to a very simple point. Padding, address, and I had the flag in three seconds. That's the long and short of my experience going through the CodeMash CTF. If you ever get a chance to go through one of these, I highly recommend it. I wouldn't be surprised if there might be no one next year. I don't know whether it'll be open or not. Um, but also Hacking Lab, I think from time to time, puts on free ones. Sweet. So absolutely highly recommend that. It's a fun experience. It got me to use parts of my brain uh, that I hadn't had to use in a while. And unfortunately, it got me started using parts of my brain that then engaged the help of others to bring me back down to earth and go, y you know, you're kind of overthinking this. Anybody have any questions? Alex! <laughs> Smidge. Anybody else? Alex always has the best questions. I understand why nobody else wants to ask a question. That's cool. Well, thank you so much for your time. I hope you found this entertaining. If you have any questions later on, I'll be probably over there. <laughs>